Oh, and welcome once again. Um, we're now going to delve into Chapter 7, and in Chapter 7, we start to lay the foundation of procedural programming. We've been doing this imperative programming approach all along, and so let's step back and see, what is our story so far? Well, we started off by saying that our computational solutions consist of essentially some kind of data representation plus the algorithms that manipulate that data or that data structure that we have. And we pointed to this um, book that Nicholas Wirth, the inventor of Pascal, had written, where the title of the book was Data Representation or Data Structures plus Algorithms Equal Programs. For us, it's the data representation plus algorithms equal computational solutions. And it speaks to the centrality of both of these ideas. How do you represent the data that you get, which remember are the structured um, values from your observations of um, the physical world, and how you can manipulate them using these algorithms or these instructions. Um, and we realize that these algorithms can be broken down or be composed of three control structures. The structured programming theorem tells us that. In reality, we can break it down into even um, a smaller granularity of just one. But uh, from a software engineering perspective, these three control structures allow us to express any algorithm um, that can be utilized for any problem that's computable or any function that's computable. And those three control structures are sequence, selection, and iteration. Remember, a sequence, you execute one instruction after the next in the order that they're presented, and the order is very important. Um, if you switch the order, it changes the, the algorithm or the essence of the instruction. Then there's a selection. Remember, this was the Robert Frost poem. When you're going along, you come to a fork in the road, you got to make a decision and choose one or the other. That's the selection, the if um, control structure in Python and Java and, and similar programming languages. And the third control structure was iteration. And in iteration, we're talking about the idea of repeating something or looping something for a certain amount of time. With these three control structures and an appropriate data representation, we can solve any computable function, um, any function that has a, that can be computed. But we realize that, you know, there are, as Paul Simon has said, there are 50 ways to leave your lover. Well, there are many more than 50 ways to solve most computational problems. In fact, almost every problem that you are faced with can be solved in multiple ways. Let's see a simpler example to sort of put this into context. Suppose you wanted to just move a chair. You had a chair in your classroom or your office, or your room, and you wanted to move it. So there are a couple of ways to do it. You could just directly move it, right? You could just take it from point A and move it to point B. If you wanted to, you could do something really convoluted and you could run a few laps all the way around campus or your house or wherever you live or wherever you are and then come back and move it or move it a little bit, go run around, move it a little bit more, go run around. I don't know why you'd want to pick that approach, but perhaps there's a pressing reason why you might want to do it. But both of those are um, solutions to the problem of moving the chair. Both of them end with the chair having moved from point A to point B, but one approach is evidently more efficient than another for most constraints, um, for most problems that we have. If you're if your constraint was move it in a way where you get the most exercise, well, maybe that other way is the better way. But if your goal is to actually just move the chair, then moving it directly is probably the best, the most efficient way to go about it. So this idea of finding the most efficient way or the most parsimonious way to do something um, led to the idea uh, led to the idea that software should be developed in a in an efficient way and in a parsimonious manner. And so people started to apply engineering ideas to software development, since engineering ideas had proved um, so effective in other areas and fields. And this led to the uh, development of the field of software engineering. This was innovated by people like Margaret Hamilton at NASA um, in the 60s, and eventually this field has grown. And one of the aspects that we see in it is that a way to make more solution uh, to make the solutions more efficient is to increase the level of abstraction. So, for example, in the moving chair um, analogy that we were looking at, 
the room that you might, if you're in a classroom, the room might have a bunch of things in it, projectors and, de and you know, windows and blinds on the windows and things like that. Well, those aren't really relevant to the problem usually. If all you're doing is moving the chair, it doesn't really matter if you have three windows or five windows and whether they're um, open or closed or the blinds are down or whether there's a projector up on the wall or not. Again, it depends on the constraint. If for some reason the cold in the room was important to you, then whether the windows open or not would probably affect it. But in general, you can choose some details of the problem or the environment that you're looking at or the model that you have and ignore them. That's the idea of abstraction. The idea of abstraction is you simply ignore any details that you deem to be inessential to the problem that you're trying to solve. You'd probably keep track of things like the number of tables and the other chairs in the room though, right? Because they might get in your way. So you have to choose which details in the problem context you decide are going to be unnecessary or inessential. And so one of the ways that we can increase the abstraction in our programmatic solutions as we develop these software programs um, is that we can package our code into little pieces, into manageable pieces, and that makes our solution more general. Those manageable pieces are, you usually call them subroutines, but you'll also hear them called procedures and functions. So these aren't synonyms, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that in just a bit. Um, we'll, 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 we'll start to define these ideas a little more precisely. But up to now, what we've done is we've mainly seen, remember we had that previous uh, lecture where we talked about the fundamental elements of most Python programs. And we said there are things like values, variables, and now these control structures that we've added in. Um, you know, we usually combined a lot of these things into expressions or complex statements or structures, and we used additional data structures. For example, we used the lists or tuples as well, as we saw in the um, data structures uh, lecture or chapter. And then we also used some built-in commands or functions, like the input function and the print function. So you could, if you wanted to, in theory, I, I suppose, just build um, all your programs using just these instructions. These are all that you need. But from a practical perspective, from an engineering perspective, from a perspective of um, efficiency and parsimony, these instructions alone aren't enough. You know, some applications are really huge. They have 10 million lines of code, and often the development of the code is distributed geographically and conceptually, and different people work on different parts of it, and then eventually bring it all together and, and you know, sew it, stitch it together. So that part can get very complex and very tough and very confusing. So subroutines to the rescue, right? These things help divide a program into manageable pieces so that you can plug them together again and work on them individually. So rather than working on 10 million lines of code in one shot, you work on just that little manageable piece or that little subroutine that you have. This is another form of abstraction, right? Since it gives us a more general and less detailed view of the system. If instead of listing all those 10 million lines of code, I break it up into three subroutines or three modules, if you if you want to call it that in this modular programming approach, and I say this is get data, this is process data, and this is uh, output data, right? Now I've got I've gotten rid of the details, but and it's but it's also more general, and I can get a good sense and overview of exactly what this system might do. A subroutine in this context is going to be just a named group of instructions. It's a name for that group of instructions that I put under input data, for example. Input data might be just a name that I assign to that bunch of um, instructions that actually go out and get the data, the six million lines of code. I said. <laughs> let's say that do that. That's not a very realistic example, of course, but let's go with it nonetheless. <laughs> 
Um, and so these instructions, there are other, other aspects of it, but in this first approximation, we can think of it that way. And the subroutines that we construct, we can invoke them or call them as many times as we need in a given program. And then here's the beauty of it. We can take these subroutines that we've written and reuse them both in that same program multiple times without having to rewrite or recopy all of that or in different programs as well. So these subroutines become fundamental building blocks in software construction since the parts of the system don't have to be created from scratch um, because these subroutines can actually be reused. Let's think of a maybe more salient example for most of you guys, right? Certainly for me, it's making lunch. So my kid loves to have peanut butter and jelly for lunch every day. Absolutely favorite lunch. So the lunch has the peanut butter and jelly, but it also has additional stuff. It has things like sometimes carrots, sometimes cookies, but it always has peanut butter and jelly. Gotta have that PB&J, right? So now I know what I have to do in that process or routine every day. I know when I make lunch, some parts of the process might vary. For example, am I gonna chop up the carrots? Am I gonna go get the cookies and maybe snag one myself while I'm putting it in there? But when it's time for the PB&J, because I know it has to contain PB&J, I know exactly how that procedure goes. Well, the same thing that I do in real life is similar to what I do in Python. I can define a procedure or a function to make the sandwich. We'll talk about the technical distinction between these two uh, later on. But I started off, and we'll talk about this as well. I use a keyword def. This is in Python, right? This is my making um, or make PB&J, my make peanut butter jelly uh, sandwich uh, procedure or function written in Python code. And you can see why Python's so popular because you can kind of read this, and this isn't really Python. So, you know, so for example, the first part is the function header, as we'll see, is, but this part is just pseudocode to get an idea of, of what it's like. But it's informative nonetheless. So we start off and we say define a new procedure or function. That procedure or function is called make PB and J. And it takes as inputs the peanut butter, the jelly, and the bread. And what does it do with that stuff? Well, you put the peanut butter on the bread, you put the jelly on the bread, and you cut it into squares. Great. Now when I want to make lunch on a certain day, say Monday, what I'll do is Monday I'm going to give the kid carrots. So I go and get carrots, and then I make peanut butter and jelly with Skippy. you got to use the right peanut butter, right? Anything else is verboten. And then you get like that nice farm jelly and you pop it on some Wonder Bread. Oh, don't use Wonder Bread. My, my wife would kill me if I did that. But on another day, maybe Tuesday, when he doesn't get the cooked carrots, instead we give him cookies. So you go and get the cookies instead, but you still call or invoke or utilize the make PB&J uh, function or procedure or method. They're, they're gonna, some of these terms are synonymous, others are not. We'll draw these distinctions as we go into it further. Um, but you can use them interchangeably at this, at this level. Yet another example that might bring this to bear, you know, when you have a morning routine that you might have, when you get up and you're gonna make um, coffee for yourself, right? You'll, the way that you do that is you grab the coffee grounds, you boil some water and then you add the coffee grounds to it and then you can finally wake yourself up with this. My wife loves her morning coffee. So we might illustrate this procedure of making coffee in the morning as get the coffee grounds, boil the water, put it together into that magical concoction. So we can create a function for this and that function can be represented as a coffee maker. So this single entity now encapsulates this is another one of these key words that we're going to see pop up especially when we get to the object oriented programming paradigm so this single entity the coffee maker encapsulates or puts together a number of steps and is referred to as a subroutine or procedure or function in computer science so for now we can just think of the function as a name for a particular sequence of instructions that we have Right, the sequence of instructions, for example, that we call coffee maker. 
This is also that idea of abstraction, another thing that's central to the object-oriented programming paradigm. We see that here in the procedural or modular approach as well. And once you've defined this coffee maker function, you can just use the name coffee maker everywhere you'd normally utilize that entire sequence of instructions, right, to show what you're doing. So if I was explaining to someone how to make coffee, I'd say, okay, get the coffee grounds, boil the water, add the water, mix it up, and you've got coffee. How do I make it? Same thing. Uh, get the coffee grounds, boil the water, mix it up, make the coffee. Now I can forego all of that and say, how do you make the coffee? Get the coffee maker. That's it. I don't need to explain anything else. Just get the coffee maker. The coffee maker might be me. The coffee maker might be machine. The coffee maker might be this function and software, as you might have, depending on what that computing agent is. If we want to use that, you know, sort of torture that language and metaphor just a bit. So a function in computer science, we should start to um, make this idea a little more precise, slightly different than a function as defined in mathematics. We know that a mathematical function is basically some process that takes some input and maps it to some output. In computer science, we're going to sort of see there's a similar idea like that, and then there are other ideas that are more general and perhaps a little more powerful as well, which are sometimes referred to with the same nomenclature. So let's look at these in a little more detail, right? Subroutines, procedures, and functions. So subroutine is uh, usually some named sequence of instructions. It doesn't always have to be in some languages and under certain circumstances, but in general, it's got a name associated with it. To perform some task that's encapsulated or brought together as a single unit, right? As we saw earlier. So a procedure is a subroutine, and this subroutine might actually take some input as well, and it can have a side effect. We're going to talk about that in just a bit, but it does not return a value as output. That's the important distinction. And a side effect, when we talk about it in computer science, it just means that it's some imperative, some instruction uh, that changes something like changing a variable's value or writing to a file or reading from a file or sending data somewhere else. So a function then is going to be a procedure that does return a value. And that output value can be returned um, on different, that output value that you get might be different when you call the function at different times with different potential inputs or not. The inputs are still optional in this case. And there are some small distinctions that can sometimes be drawn. You know, we might say that a pure function that we have um, always returns the same value on all calls for some specific input and doesn't produce any side effects. Then we start to get closer to the idea of the mathematical function, right? We'll also talk about how it's used in functional programming. But functions in general, we start off by first defining the function and then in Python. And then when the program itself starts, we can call or invoke the function as many times as we want. As we've sort of seen already, certainly with the input and the print functions as well, we use the functional notation from algebra. And what that means is we use parentheses after the name of the function the name or the identifier of the function. So for example, if we wanted to invoke or call or use the coffee maker function, we know it's a function because of this functional notation. We've got the parentheses that come after the name. And that denotes a function or procedure. And if it did have input, that function or procedure, it would go within the parentheses. So for example, if we wanted to pass a certain kind of coffee grounds, depending on whether we used coffee grounds at all or used different ones or a certain brand name on certain days, that would be the input. The input would be what we refer to as the function's parameter. And we can draw further distinction here between the parameters that we utilize or delineate within the function's definition. Those ones are called the formal parameters or the parameters that we pass to the function when it's called or invoked. And these parameters are called the actual parameters or synonymously the arguments because they contain the values 
that the function is going to use in order to um, do whatever processing it needs to do. So functions in Python work exactly the same way. We first define the procedure function using this keyword def. There's some certain reserved keywords. And as we saw in the text, we created this function called print the chorus. And we can call or invoke that procedure as many times as we want using the functional notation, right? And the functional notation uses a pair of parentheses after the name of the procedure, just like we did in the text with print the chorus. All right. So let's take a little summary of where we, where we are so far. Functions are sort of our first attempt at modularizing um, a program or a software solution or a computational solution that we have. And there's this trend of increasing abstraction in higher and higher levels of programming. And when we get to object-oriented programming, we'll see that it also follows this kind of modularization and abstraction. So all these concepts that we learn, we can carry over and they sort of build upon each other. We know that Python already understands some keywords and commands. Um, and some of these commands are now functions. For example, print went from being just a statement in Python 2.x to being a full-fledged function in 3.x. And Python also understands some values like numbers and strings, numeric values and string literals, etc. And now we know that it uses functional notation, just like in algebra. You have some function, it takes some input x, and it dumps out some output. Well, how does a function look in algebra? In algebra, a function has also has a name or an identifier, right? So it also has this name or identifier and some arguments that are passed in or parameters that you might have. So the function in this case might be the function f, uses that uh, functional notation with the parentheses, and the argument or parameter is x. And in regular algebra, you might have a statement that you have uh, or an expression that you might have in algebra, like y is equal to f of x. Turns out you can carry this over almost exactly to Python. This is one of the reasons why Python's so popular. It's so close to the mathematical expressions that we might normally utilize. And so if I wanted to define this function in Python, that's what I do. I'd have a function header. In this case, here's my function header. Define f of z. It begins with the keyword def, which stands for define, followed by the identifier or name of the function. In this case, we continue to just choose to call it f. It's no problem. That's a valid identifier in Python. And then it's followed by a comma separated list that might be empty of any parameters that it has within the parentheses. And that's z in this case. So it says it takes a, um, one parameter z. And that parameter z in this case is the formal parameter. And then there's a colon, which indicates the end of the header. And then the body of the function, the function body follows and is indented. If that function body consists of one statement, as this one, it's very easy. That's that one uh, statement that's indented, but can consist of more than one statement. And if they all belong within the function definition, they all need to be indented accordingly. And that program block um, contains the function's imperative statements, right? These are the actual commands that it's going to execute. So in this case, all it does is it returns a value. It, and that value is whatever was passed in. Whatever values in that formal parameter z, it multiplies it by itself, squares it, and returns that. So this function's a square function, right? Kind of easy at this point. And um, the indentation is very important. It has to be relative to the function header. But you can see that this code is very similar to what we saw earlier with the uh, mathematical notation. All we added in was a definition of the function. You could do that in math as well. You could say f of x equals um, x times x, and then you could say f of 3, y equals f of 3, something along those lines. That's exactly what we do over here. We can use a, an intermediate variable like x, so it's exactly that other notation we saw earlier, or we can just put 5 in here directly instead of x. Could do it anyway, and then Whatever that value is, so 5 times 5, 25 in this case, that's what's printed out when 
we say print y. So the function invocation that we saw had to happen. That function invocation is when you call or utilize the function. We saw that before we could use it, that function had to be defined. Right? Makes sense. If uh, Python didn't have a function that was defined and you tried to utilize it, it would say, what do you mean? It, it's the same as in real life. You go up to some friend and you say, gobbledygook, and they're like, what does that mean? And you say, ah, by gobbledygook, I mean this thing. And you define what you meant by that. These functions are usually defined at the top of a program, but as long as they're defined before you use it, that's the only real um, requirement that Python has. The rest is sort of this um, software design or engineering principles that you might utilize, and that might be dependent on the particular application or the organization within which you're doing this. And of course, we mentioned that the actual values that are passed to the function are called the actual parameters or arguments, and these are the values. They can be the values directly, or they can be an expression that evaluates um, to that value, and for example, a variable that holds that value. Now, some functions return values, as we saw, as well with the f of x, right? It returned the square of um, uh, some uh, function that uh, of some value that it had, and a value returning function is basically a function that's called for its return value. It's literally the purpose of it is that you want the return value. That's the main thing. And it's just like a mathematical function in this case. So I might define a function like f of x equals 2x. And in this notation, in this notation, or you know, maybe I'll just make it the previous one, x times x, make it x square again. And in this notation, the x stands for any numeric value that the function f may be applied to. We could apply it particularly to f of 2. So in this case, x is the formal parameter and 2 is the actual parameter or argument. That's passed in to that opaque box. Remember, we think of it as a function as an opaque box. We can think of it that way. And what it does is it squares the 2 and it calculates the value 4 and that's what's returned. And value returning functions in Python are used just the same way. Their call, wherever you call them, or invoke them, that call or invocation is replaced with their final value. Let's take a quick peek at that, right? So this final, let me change this definition so it matches as well um, what we had earlier. So this uh, value returning function is basically a subroutine that's called for its return value, and so is very similar to a mathematical function. Not quite exactly the same as we saw earlier. So x can stand for, in this case, any numeric value um, that the function may be applied to. And in this case, if we're changing it, I suppose I should be consistent and change it correctly. And so I can call that same function multiple times, right? This was the advantage, the reuse, the function reuse that we can have. And we can track its um, values by, by creating this little symbol table and sort of keeping track in a, in a very simple symbol table of both the name of the variable and the value that it contains. And we can do it in multiple ways if we wanted to. And I'll, I think we should update these values accordingly. So for x, the first time that you call it, um, it'll still be 1. And the second time that you call it, it'll be 100, right? If we're sticking with that definition of f, as um, something that squares its input. That's what the storage will be. This is what the symbol table might look like um, in a sense. And the final thing that we'll touch upon is that functions, you can use function composition just as you would in math. So for example, in mathematics, if you had a function called y equals f of x, f of x is a function, then you wanted to send the output of f of x to another function g of x, you can use function composition directly and say g of f of x, which is the same as g of y, and whatever you get is the value z. Well, you can do the exact same thing with functions in Python. You can take the output of one function, for example, format, and send it as the input to another function, in this case, print. 
And you can do both function composition and function chaining, as we'll see. But we'll save that story for another time. And until then, we'll see you. Bye-bye.